Hi, Sean. Hello. Uh, I'm Sarah Posner, Senior Editor at Religion Dispatches, and for the latest edition of my Blogging Heads show, I have with me today Sean Faircloth, who is the Director of Strategy and Policy at the Richard Doss Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and he's also the author of a new book called The Attack of the Theocrats. Uh, Hi, Sean. <laughs> Hello. Great to be with you. Great. So, well, I wanted to talk generally with you about the how religion has been playing in the presidential campaign so far. And just yesterday, Rick Santorum gave us some great uh, uh, talking points <laughs> when he said that uh, John F. Kennedy's 1960 speech when he was running for president, um, where he affirmed his commitment to the separation of church and state, Rick Santorum said that made him want to throw up. Yeah, so, I think he actually said that earlier at some he point. He did, actually. Yeah. He had said it uh, in a uh, some other speech or radio broadcast at some previous yeah. time. Uh, do you think that this marks even a, a new downward trend in Republican opposition to the separation of church and state? He is the embodiment of what has been a trend over several decades. And uh, really, in some ways, we should not be surprised because, as I, I write in my book, this type of politician uh, has been bubbling up in the city councils, the school boards, and the state legislatures for three decades or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is in some ways a culmination, although certainly George W. Bush played a very significant uh, role in that. Um, it also interesting is the John F. Kennedy speech. Um, I was working on this book uh, you know, for the past year, year and a half, and uh, just came out February 15th. And some of my speeches that I gave before that uh, on separation of church and state, I would bring up uh, John F. Kennedy's Houston speech, and it was known by people familiar with American politics or people mm -hmm. who are academically knowledgeable about the separation of church and state. But it's fascinating how a speech from now, uh, 52 years ago, right? Yes. Right, a, right. a speech from 52 years ago is playing such a significant role in the 2012 presidential campaign uh, one thing I say to John Kennedy's uh, credit in my book is that he seemed to really mean it. Uh, obviously, <laughs> part of the reason he delivered the speech was uh, dealing with the issue of his Catholicism. But right. when he was president, he actually was maybe the strongest church-state separationist uh, after James Madison in the White House. And he uh, spoke... Uh, in a way that was supportive of the Supreme Court ruling on a government orchestrated prayer in classrooms. Which occurred while he was president. Right, that, that, exactly. That decision came down while he was president, right. Yeah, the mood in this country is dramatically different than that era. I quote in my book regularly also uh, a friend of President Kennedy's, but a political opposite, uh, Barry Goldwater, who uh, said, and I think I quote him exactly, I have no respect for the religious right. So Barry Goldwater, Mr. Conservative, Mr. Republican, uh, wouldn't have a shot in a Republican primary today. So do you think, uh, do you think Santorum has gone too far, though, even for the Republican Party? Yes, uh, in the long run. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he may do well in this or that demographic within the Republican primary, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly in some ways he does embody uh, values that are indeed supported by a significant electorate within the Republican primaries. But in the general election, uh, you know, uh, Yogi Berra said, never make predictions, especially about the future, but my prediction <laughs> is that uh, that won't play in the long run. That the, the but do you great think that middle, it would play for a, a, a him? A telling even... point, a pivotal telling point in American right. politics was the Mississippi referendum vote. Uh, because here it is a state, uh, you know, let, let's sort of make it the right wing. You're talking about the personhood? The person yeah, the personhood uh, vote in, in uh, Mississippi. That, mm -hmm. it, it make it the uh, right wing version of New York, New York. You know, if, if you can't make it there, you can't make it anywhere. 
And uh, here you are in Mississippi, and I think what it comes down to is there's a lot of talk of religion in our society, and even people who mouth the words about its imposition. But when it gets right down to, oh, wait, maybe that would apply to me or someone I know in my own personal life, then people back right off, the majority well, do anyway. You know, I wonder, and I, I don't know that whether we've seen enough or any exit polling from Mississippi from that referendum vote, but there, there's more. There was more opposition to the personhood amendment than merely people who were afraid of its far-reaching ramifications beyond just banning abortion, but banning certain methods of birth control and banning certain in vitro fertilization methods, and so on. There were uh, religious right activists, and even the Catholic conference, the Catholic bishops in Mississippi were opposed to the personhood amendment because they were afraid from a strategic or tactical standpoint that it wouldn't be a good challenge to Roe versus Wade, that if it made its way up to the Supreme Court that it wouldn't have a good outcome from their perspective. So I wonder if there's more support for personhood amendments in theory than we realize because some of the opposition to the personhood amendments comes from the religious right itself. It may be, but my sense is, is at the, the street level, at the rank and file level, I think people react it goes to too it far. more, you know, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that the, the Catholic bishops that you mentioned are attempting uh, to engage in a political strategy, and I consider this one of the key trends in American politics uh, today. In, uh, I, in, indeed, I saw part of your interview with the gentleman from Catholic University, uh, where he talked about uh, so-called religious liberty, and he brought up the, what I call the new holy trinity of the fundamentalist right, he calls them evangelicals, uh, the Mormon church, the LDS, and uh, American Catholicism. You know, I'm a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. I joined the Jesuit Volunteer Corps after college. I went to... And then what State. happened? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and then what happened? Well, actually, I wasn't even religious then, and I had a great experience both at Notre Dame and uh, in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And uh -huh. The Jesuit Volunteer Corps was not a proselytizing entity. It was kind of like okay. a Peace Corps, and it really they were strict about not proselytizing, in fact. But my point being is I, I've been steeped in Catholicism. There's been a dramatic change in yes. recent decades in the nature of the political thinking within the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, not necessarily so much among people who maybe say, oh, I'm Catholic, uh, but I'm talking about the, the leadership of the Catholic Church has grown much more conservative and fascinatingly compared to, say, Kennedy's time, much mm -hmm. more aligned with the Mormon Church and with the fundamentalist Protestant right. And that really, those three together are really the new most significant power in uh, religion and politics today. But I think that the, the, the connection with the LDS Church is one merely of convenience or political expediency rather than orthodoxy because on the one hand you saw the welcoming of the role of the LDS church in the Proposition 8 battle in California right. for example but then on the other hand you'll find prominent evangelical uh, writers and clergy speaking out against Mormonism as you know some will go as far as to say it's a cult, like Robert Jeffress, the, the pastor who endorsed Rick Perry. And others will only <laughs> go so far as to say that they don't think a Mormon should be president because they think a Christian should be president and they don't consider Mormonism to be Christianity. That's true. Uh, although, I think, again, uh, among the majority of rank file, when they show polling data of Romney against Obama, those who believe in the religious right viewpoint uh, tend very strongly uh, to go with, with Mitt Romney's uh, viewpoint, and he checks the vast majority of their boxes. If I could return to the Catholic Church, though, for a second, because I, I think this is an important uh, point. When they use the religious liberty argument, indeed that mm -hmm. phrase has been something the fundamentalist Protestant right has used for some time, it also, I think, shows a reprioritization within the Catholic Church. When I was at college at Notre Dame, um, there was a significant and leading 
leftist uh, viewpoint within the Catholic Church, a sort of working class and fighting for the underprivileged. I'll right. call them sort of Kennedy Catholics, or you know that that viewpoint, Irish working class tradition. Um, many of that demographic, first of all, have uh, have in large measure stopped attending. And then secondly, leadership in the Catholic Church has seemed to say, well, we're, we're going to assume, we're going to embrace the strategy of religious liberty and make the sexual issues, the contraception, gay um, equality, these are our, our uh, issues where we really are going to make the major media push and the major effort. And they don't say, we're going to hand out flyers from the parish to help poor children. Uh, that's not some big political effort. Uh, they may, and their lobbyists may say, oh, yes, we favor programs for the poor, but that is not the litmus test and, and the motivating factor anymore. And I, and I think that that provides greater unity with the fundamentalist right. So were you surprised when the contraception issue became such a big issue in the past two months? Well, I think it was their smartest move. I don't agree with it, but I feel like you could make that argument and have some traction. And the religious liberty phrasing, indeed, is that's why they use it. It, it sounds good. Obviously, on, on the merits, I, I, when it's the people who are coming to institutions that they run that uh, are denied these services, I, I think the argument uh, falls apart. And the fact, I thought it was fascinating that the bishops, in response to a study, the Gutmacher Institute study, that said I don't know, something like 70% of women who identify themselves as Catholics say that they are sexually experiencing, 70% uh, of unmarried ones say they're sexually experienced, and then 98% of those basically uh, use contraception or have in one form or another. And in response, the Catholic bishops uh, compared it to tax cheats. Uh, I mean, they're really out there now at this point, and despite there being political strategists uh, and using the religious liberty tact, which I think is their best tag, it's still overall, they sort of show their hand, and, it, and I don't think it looks too pretty. Well, I, something that's been on my mind since this whole, the Daryl Ice's hearing a couple of weeks ago, and the whole, I don't even, I don't want to call it a controversy, because it's not like it's a contra, an, an actual controversy, it's a, con, it's a manufactured controversy over the contraception coverage. And so Daryl Issa has a hearing that I, I got to take one said, quick break here. So after Daryl Issa's hearing a couple weeks ago where the Republicans framed this as a religious freedom issue, they said it's not about women's health, it's not about access to contraception, it's about religious freedom. And the Democrats said, no, it's about women's health, it's about access to contraception. And I kind of felt like that was a mistake to just make that so such a binary question because it is about the it is about religious freedom in the sense that the republicans have tried to frame it that way and it's i think that it's necessary to rebut that as opposed to just say well you know it's not about that it's really about their desire to <clears throat> restrict women's access to re reproductive health care because i think that they're trying to lay a groundwork for religious conscious exemptions and other types of religious exemptions from laws from you know generally applicable laws through this so to not address those religious freedom claims head on invites right. this happening again with another issue yeah exactly um to me they should take the issue on directly and if you allow that label, religious liberty, to apply these terms, then pretty soon the population is going to believe it. When, of course, the key point is, and this is true also with issues in my book, is they'll always say, oh, it's our religious freedom. I say, well, if it's truly your religious liberty under the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment Free Expression Clause, sue in court and win. But, of course, they can't. They need a statute. And as they know, in that, this particular instance, there's, I think it's 28 states already have this on the book, and indeed they've been complying in, uh, in these 28 states. It's, it's a political strategy to relabel uh, these issues, and it is incorrect strategy for those who disagree not to directly confront it. I always say that I'm a flat-out absolutist advocate for religious liberty as defined in the Constitution, and what you choose to do, uh, 
Mr. or Ms. religious person as to your own choices. Uh, we're going to support that as for yourself. What they really want is to impose their viewpoint uh, on others and, and affect other people. And That's what they're saying about you. They say the atheist, the atheism is a religion right, and right, yeah. that you are trying to impose your religion. Mm -hmm. So how do you address that if that's their rejoinder? Well, the key point is I would, I would, uh, I hope uh, not to get too melodramatic here, but if, if the moment came, I hope I would take up arms to protect uh, the rights of a religious person to practice their own religion as it affects themselves uh, as they see fit. But what they are seeking to do is to pass legislation, legislation that they need because the Constitution does not uh, create this as a religious right, uh, that would affect others. Uh, again, they, did, they didn't challenge the, the statutes in those 28 states and win. Well, they did in two of them. They did in two of them and lost. Right, and lost. Excuse me. Yes, <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't prevail. And, right. And, and, and so they know they can't win on the merits uh, on the true definition of religious liberty in the Constitution. So they're trying to create a, a, a wider birth for it. And to me, the, the key counter argument is that, in effect, what they always want to do is have, you know, the old saying, your freedom ends at the tip of the other person's nose. Well, no, they, they want to have their so-called religious freedom uh, affect others beyond their own circle. And that is something that is, is unjust. And it's, and it's not just in, in this. I mean, I write in my book about scores of laws, whether it's in child care, faith healing, uh, land use planning, a whole range of areas, again, statutorily created, not issues that are required by some constitutional finding. Uh, that give special privilege to religion. And yet, they often get away with a label of, well, that's our religious liberty. And I think we need to uh, speak out more about this. And unfortunately, this recent uh, business about contraception is, is part of a 20 to 30 year trend. But where do you draw the line? I mean, do you think that certain religious exemptions are necessary to protect people's religious freedom? And then, how difficult is it to say, well, this sort of religious exemption is acceptable, but this sort of religious exemption is not? Well, my general line is, is more of a constitutional one, which I think when you go into court fighting, is that really those religious liberties are what affects you yourself, and, and I would adamantly protect those. Um, general, laws of general application however, are laws of general application. It's interesting. Uh, so you mean a law that's not, wasn't written to single out somebody, somebody's religion, that the purpose of the law wasn't to Right, I mean, in the old Catholics case about the peyote, we may be sympathetic, you know, with Native Americans who, part of their religious practice, want to, you know, take some drug that's generally illegal. Right. Uh, but I'd say they don't have any constitutional right to that. And furthermore... My viewpoint of it is that generally I don't want to see laws that create exemptions for that uh, because that's going beyond what the Constitution uh, provides. And but there are a lot of exemptions that have been in place. I mean, I'm thinking particularly in the healthcare area, you know, exemptions for uh, Christian scientists, mm -hmm. uh, exemptions uh, for, there's an exemption in the Affordable Care Act for people who belong to these what they're called healthcare sharing ministries. Well, let's take the Christian Science one because okay. I think it, it sets some, I think, ominous and precedents. And actually, speaking of Kennedys, yes. didn't Teddy Kennedy play a role in getting this exemption for the Christian Science? Yeah, Scientists? it's interesting. Uh, Ted Kennedy, who, uh, you know, my own personal opinion, I served 10 years in politics uh, before mm -hmm. writing this book, and uh, I think anyone who's objective about it will say that he was one of the most effective legislators ever. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I generally tended to agree with him. But he actually was distinct from President Kennedy with regard to religious issues. He tended to, on more than one occasion, align himself with uh, Orrin Hatch on religious land use planning and then also uh, the Christian Science Church's headquarters in Massachusetts. I don't know right. if that had anything to do with it. but Right, right. You know, but he took that perspective. But for me, it's wrong. I used to serve as an assistant attorney general handling child protection cases for a brief mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. 
But I ended up handling, you know, hundreds of those cases, and I saw a lot of gruesome things. And I hope that uh, most everyone would agree that there should be one consistent standard. And yet, in 38 states of the Union, and this is because federal law authorizes an exemption of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, in uh, 38 states, uh, there is some form of more lenient standard for so-called faith healing, which is a misnomer. If it was faith healing, I'd be for it. It's more like faith harming or faith killing mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but creating this separate legal standard in, endangers children and sometimes takes their lives. And it doesn't make sense. And, and, and I think it ties interestingly to this, this uh, recent religious liberty argument from the church because you took it to its logical extreme. And said, well, we're not, we, you know, the Catholic Church, we're not going to provide contraceptive or reproductive uh, services in our institutions that affect uh, people who have different views, including Catholics who have different views. Um, we're going to impose that on these other people. Similarly, you could theoretically have institutions that say, well, part of our religious practice is, you know, faith healing, or say Scientology is another example. Say you had some religious. Uh, hospital or institution that's a Scientologist, as Tom Cruise has made clear to us, uh, you know, uh, they object to psychology and psychoactive medication. So does that mean that those institutions do not provide that? I mean, the logic of that, if you treat all religions equally as you must, would lead to some extreme and bizarre results. But I think that the proponents of the current religious liberty framing do not think that all religions should be treated equally. They think oh, exactly. that there is a Christian <laughs> heritage to our country that entitles them in particular to certain exemptions because of the alleged Christian heritage of the country. So I think the different examples that we're pointing out, I think, point out different issues or different problems with the politics of these issues. It's fascinating. On one hand, you um, have the, the sort of the religious lobbying issue, which may have led to the exemption for Christian scientists because the Christian scientists are based in Massachusetts and they went and lobbied their senator, right? Right. And then on the other side, or not other side, but another, a different kind of example is the example of proponents of the Christian nation mythology. Right. who say that, well, this has to happen because we are a Christian nation and this legislation is not Christian legislation because, or this regulation, because, you know, Christians or these certain kind of Christians are against contraception. Yeah, I have a chapter in, in my book called The Fundamentalist 50, and I just like the alliteration of it. I could have written The Fundamentalist 100, but it's about uh, sitting members of Congress who have made particularly theocratic uh, statements and it's really uh, even more widespread than that. But it, I know one member of Congress in particular was railing against uh, this specter of uh, Sharia law, Muslim law in the United States. Oklahoma actually, I think, passed legislation saying there shall be no Sharia law in Oklahoma. As which was found unconstitutional, by the way. Which is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and, and raising the specter of something that really, there's no realistic issue of it happening. And, and by the way, just parenthetically, I'm the first to say that yeah, if, you know, as is, there are valid concerns in Europe and elsewhere about Islamic religious law, uh, seeping its way into the culture, and, and I would oppose that if it were happening here. It's just not happening here. What is happening here is the fundamentalist uh, Christian viewpoint uh, is getting a lot of traction in American public policy, and now, as I say, particularly when it's intertwined with and supported by on major key points, the Mormon Church and, and the Catholic Church as well. And you mentioned about the mythology. There's another chapter in my book where I try to make the book kind of a toolbox an easy uh, toolkit for people to talk to their neighbors and friends about these issues. And one chapter is about what our founders' views were, uh, really offering quotes and specifics that show how uh, strongly they supported separation of church and state, and frankly that the other side has just been directly misleading the American people uh, in an orchestrated effort for some time. But I think that there's there's another view of all of this. So there's, you know, yes, you talk about the the theocrats in, in Congress who you make these statements and uh, try to press for these laws. But there's also the view, I think, from the democratic or democratic leaning side of things that religion, they, they, they say, oh, well, we believe in the separation of church and state, but we also believe that you know, religious exemption, religious conscience ex exemption, religious conscience 
objections, sorry, sure. need to be accommodated. So when Obama, going back to the contraception thing, just because it's kind of mm -hmm. the most vivid and recent uh, example of this, um, when Obama announced the rule on January 20th, before he made the accommodation, there was outcry from Democrats who said that Obama really needed to listen to the objection that the Catholic bishops had raised right. because Catholic hospitals and healthcare providers uh, do a lot of great work in this country providing health care to people, incidentally, frequently with financial support from the American taxpayer. Uh, Which is so, often not mentioned in that context. I'm so, glad you but how out. do you? But how? How do you address that? With so you're you're talking with somebody who's not a Republican and not a follower of David Barton and wall builders and the whole you know myth of the Christian nation, but they nonetheless believe that these various federal and state laws and regulations need to take into account what they say are the legitimate religious objections of people right. of faith, quote unquote. You know, I served in politics 10 years, and, and I attribute this to some degree to the, uh, the nice, clean-cut uh, citizen lobbyist uh, challenge. You know, if you have faith healing laws, for example, you don't see the children. I interviewed a woman, now an adult, but... Uh, who, when she was a child, was in a faith healing home and uh, had an infection in her leg. The parents put a cookie tray underneath her leg so the pus would run out. She screamed in agony for weeks. Her leg bone fused. Later in life, uh, her leg was amputated. Very severe and ugly things. The politicians, like myself, when I was there, they don't see those people. They see the nice, clean-cut folks saying, geez, we want religious liberty. They don't see the consequence. And I... Um, disappointed uh, in some of the leaders today on the left who I think they view it as sort of a balancing and are we viewed as moderate and they forget to look at the most important part of laws which is how it will affect people on the ground. I mean yes it will affect, it will offend a bishop um, but let me take another example recently from the Catholic Church hierarchy about the human trafficking issue. I mean we're talking about right. thousands and thousands of, of women, or actually I'm, I'm wrong because it's not just women and females because a lot of times mm -hmm. they're girls, a lot of times mm -hmm. they're, you know, it's uh, sex trafficking, uh, they're sex workers, basically a modern form of slavery and mm -hmm. sometimes these women and girls are beaten, raped, sometimes they uh, contract HIV and I don't think those women and girls are talked about enough in this context because in the real world of uh, the Catholic Church getting our tax money to administer these programs and then refusing, literally, it sounds harsh, but it's harsh because it's true, literally with the thousands and thousands of girls, including those that get processed through the Catholic Church in this situation, you're talking about uh, girls who maybe have HIV or who have been raped or beaten, sexually molested, and we're saying, well, we're not going to provide reproductive health services for these young women, and, and I feel like they get lost in the shuffle. And one of the things I try to do in my book is really bring it down to real people. And you mentioned mm -hmm. about, a, <clears throat> excuse me, atheists and their religion and so forth. Um, my view of it is obviously I don't think that's a religion, I think it's a, a canard, but I think sometimes the secular world uh, buys into that argument or plays into it by constantly emphasizing only symbolic issues. Now I'm the first to say as a constitutionalist I, I don't want I don't know, a, a manger on public land at Christmas time, certainly not without, you know, at least counterbalancing other symbols. But to me, I think there's been an overemphasis on these symbolic questions by secular people and not enough emphasis, uh, as I try to offer my book, of real people being hurt by religious privilege and law in a huge variety of ways. Often that is not really focused upon. And Do you so think, think that health care is a particular area where this is true? Did you say health care? Yeah. Oh, certainly it is. And, you know, to me, it's fascinating. I mean, even stem cell research, where Obama's done things to improve the situation, but remember, there's still the 1996 law and there's several state laws. It's slowing down what could be a hugely positive uh, effort uh, for advancing health. We should be, you know, engaging in a space program, if you will, of stem cell research because it's really a promising field and requires great investment, but because of this pressure from the other side, and it is purely a religious pressure, 
uh, that's being uh, tamped down and the advancements in art being pursued as aggressively as they should, if you care about life. I always throw over the phrase, you know, right to life back at people because the right to life I, I'm most concerned with is the right to life of somebody who's got Parkinson's or a spinal cord injury or children who are born in faith healing homes. They have a right to life too. So another issue that I was that I've been mulling over with regard to this, because this is getting away a little bit from the religious exemption question yeah. and more to the the role of of religion in, in public schools, where there has been an effort to you know teach the controversy, as they like to say, uh, with regard to teaching evolution in public schools. Right. And I've talked to some folks who work in science education and they say there's a new trend developing to teach the controversy quote unquote with regard to global warming uh, that you know that opponents of dealing with global warming or people who say that global warming is a hoax are taking a very similar approach to the teaching of global warming and climate change in public schools as they did with evolution and, and sometimes with a religious motivation which I find fascinating that you know, who are re religious perspectives tied to this. I find the whole because use... that seems to me that it's more connected to a corporate view. Oh, it is. I think, it, I think a lot of it is. But nonetheless, you'll see religious justification, you know. And, and, and to me, it's like a cherry picking because the Bible is such a huge, big, contradictory, and vast uh, document. That I mean, just even the whole issue of homosexuality is another one. I mean, yes, there is a, a, you know, a line in the Bible, but why is that one receiving so much emphasis over many, many other provisions in the Bible? Why is it that that one gets the top priority? There's really no rhyme or reason to it. So uh, does the science education issue, is that something that is concerning you? I mean, you work for oh, a foundation much so. that's called the Foundation um, for Reason yeah. and Science. I mean, to give you <laughs> I mean, an that example. Something that, that you are focusing on? Oh, absolutely, and it's something I talk about in my book as well. I mean, it's really a tragedy. First of all, just to take uh, the Texas issue, which you're probably familiar with, the Texas State School Board, but what's scary uh, is the ramifications it has, uh, not only for the children in Texas, of which there are many, uh, but because Texas is the largest market, California and New York don't buy statewide in the same fashion as Texas. A lot of times the school textbook publishers publish to the largest market being Texas and therefore when they do things like eliminate the origin of the universe from a textbook, you know, the number, you know, it's billions of years ago they eliminated that. They tried to eliminate a reference to Jefferson in a passage and I think the mighty magnanimous of them, they did allow Jefferson to return to that passage in their textbook, but they also inserted language that's completely false uh, about uh, the America, American founders relying upon mosaic law as opposed to the Enlightenment view. So yeah, the rejection of evolution, the rejection of the origin of the universe in school textbooks, textbooks is a huge concern, and unfortunately it's had an effect in that they've actually been able to change uh, textbooks in some cases, and, and including textbooks that goes beyond. But the do you see this happening with global warming as well? I mean, are, is there a generation of school children who are going to be taught that there's a controversy over whether global warming exists or whether I wouldn't it's be surprised if you see that and and a trend with whatever else you mentioned the corporate uh, power. Uh, but whatever else uh, they find objection, we'll try to teach a controversy about that. Uh, they're very good at this sort of issue framing, religious liberty, when really I want to take away our right that you have, uh, and then uh, teach the controversy when really they want to undermine uh, settled, settled science. And uh, the confluence, by the way, you mentioned corporate power, something that I think is maybe not uh, emphasized enough is something I half-jokingly refer to as the religio-industrial complex. Uh, but when people talk, as they sometimes do, about Mitt Romney and magic underwear and that sort of thing, which I think is a valid question if you really literally really? believe, you know, in other universes. I don't, see, I actually I differ on that. I differ on, like, where you go with asking candidates about their religious belief. But finish your thought. <laughs> Well, I think it's, a, my point is, I think that that may be a valid question, but in my mind, it's not the most important question by far. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And 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 that uh, more important, and I give a speech called Why Romney's Religion Matters, is uh, the confluence of 
his worldview, uh, which very much dovetails with a corporate worldview. Uh, there is a person who is very prominent in the Mormon Church, uh, Cleon Skousen, who advocated a sort of right-wing economic ideology. He got a prominent role as an advisor to the Reagan administration, and Mitt Romney points uh, to him as someone he admires and a book that people should read. And a lot of people haven't taken Mitt seriously or haven't really looked into it. Uh, but I actually think that Mitt Romney's uh, religious values as pertains to money are very intertwined and interestingly very intertwined with corporate power. And certainly the fundamentalist Protestant right uh, through uh, people like Ralph Reed and others are deeply aligned with corporate power in a way that it wasn't the same uh, in mid 20th century America. That's not the way the Catholic Church was viewed, certainly, and the Mormon Church was more off to the side. And now you see those three coming together, and you know, with sort of Scalia Catholicism, you see maybe the one most consistent thing among them is the support for kind of corporate power, which is ironic given the alleged uh, theories of, you know, Christ helping the underprivileged. Right, if you read Matthew 25, <laughs> or right. Well, it's interesting because I. I have this conversation with people a lot about where I think it's appropriate to question candidates about their theological beliefs as opposed to the how how the um, how their theopolitics will affect their policy making. Right. Now I think that there's no doubt that Romney is a candidate who how, how, how best to put this, his, he is not ashamed of his economic views. He's not ashamed to say things like, I am not concerned about the very poor or my wife drives two Cadillacs. That seems so much a part of who he is. How much of that is influenced by his church well, background? Well, it, it is, it's hard I, to and say. this is the part that I think is relevant. But, you know, if I understand the dividing line you're suggesting, to me it doesn't matter so much, you know, some people will say, and I understand why they want to ask, you know, do you literally believe in, say, to a Catholic, do you literally believe in transubstantiation? Mm -hmm. Which, if you viewed from the outside, seems like, you know, pretty fantastical reasoning. Right. But, but what I find more concerning is that there is a theological belief in the Mormon Church about uh, financial reward being uh, part of God's blessing to you. Well, that's not just in the Mormon Church. I wrote a book about that. <laughs> and, right. And, 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 and then with our friends at the family as well. But I don't, I hope and I want your book to be more recognized for that because I feel like it's, it's not discussed that much in the well, mainstream media, but yet it well, seems to be in many ways the most consistent uh, religious viewpoint that energizes policy. As you say, that actually transfers from just, oh, this is my individual thinking to it affects how they view American public policy. Well, it affects how they view wealth inequality, which is probably the central issue in the campaign this year, even though it's not talked about. So I feel, going back to the whole questioning Romney thing, I feel like questions about underwear, I mean, like that's like asking a Jew about like why they wear a yarmulke, you know? Right. It's kind of like, yeah, I don't think we want to go there because I feel like you know, unless he said something. So, you know, Rick Santorum has said, I think that Satan is attacking America and that, right. uh, you know, attacked the, the mainline Protestant churches or what have you. I mean, he brought it up. He's much I more mean, obviously granted, saying loony things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and also, granted, he wasn't campaigning for anything at the time that he gave that speech. That was at Ave Maria University in 2008, and he, you know, probably was thinking about running for something, but he wasn't at that time running for something. But I feel like there's definitely, there, as, as much as I don't like the intertwining of religion and politics, I do think, I think because I value religious freedom and respecting other people's religious practices and beliefs that there is a line that that should be drawn i think i think there's been a lot of questions particularly about romney and right. where you draw that line i think because people are unfamiliar with mormonism and because relative to um 2,000 years of Christianity, Mormonism is a relatively new religion. Well, and you can literally so, document that their founder was a fraud. I mean, well, I can understand I think... <laughs> why people, but, but I agree with you about the ultimate point. And mine is actually beyond, I respect the religious liberty point, but 
But I also understand why other people would say, do you really believe that? But for me, I have a more strategic point. I'm an advocate, uh, you know, attacking right. theocrats. I'm advocating uh, for a more secular government. And right. my concern about that approach, about saying, tell me about your underwear, is that I worry that it will backfire on those of us who advocate for secularism, that it will, even if, even if it's a valid question, it might be perceived as petty, uh, whereas I think some of these economic issues, which I think are really uh, issues that do drive Mitt Romney, um, are valid because they are connected to his religion and they are connected to his political worldview, and I think that's, that's an, a valid area of inquiry. But I just wonder, see, to me, it's a question of how much is that influenced by his religion as opposed to how much is that influenced by the privileged position he had within his church as opposed to the religious belief itself that would uh, pull in all Mormons with that. I mean, it's not just that he, it's not just that his, that there's something in the teaching that might say something about economics. I think that there may be Mormons who differ about that, what the teaching says about economics. But I think that Romney clearly has had a privileged role, not just in politics, but in business and in his church. He was a lay, lay bishop in his church, which is the setup of the, the Mormon church they have. Um, right. They use uh, lay clergy. Uh, so I think that those questions are more relevant to his positioning as opposed to relevant to Mormon theology. Because I think once you start questioning theology and individuals' theology, it, it, it raises a lot of questions about, well, are you trying to paint all Mormons with a broad brush here? Because I know Mormons who don't really sure. subscribe to, to No, I, I think there is variation the within it. Yeah. But right. I do think if you look at the chapter in my book, uh, about the fundamentalist 50. And then you look at the law. By the way, I have I to describe, show the cover of your book. I'm showing it right now. <laughs> uh, the laws that I describe in, in my book, that view, the sort of economic elitist view combined with a severe, uh, I almost say sexually obsessed uh, view of restriction on people's intimate decisions, that that has become a driving viewpoint so there, there are, I'm sure, I mean, there are liberal Democrat Mormons and all the rest, but in American politics, uh, for sitting office holders, you tend, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but mm -hmm. I will generalize to some degree to say that you generally have politicians who just don't go there and aren't involved in, in, in using religion as, as really an expression other than being almost forced to do so as, as politicians tip their hat to it. And then there are those who literally have a driving worldview, and it tends to be one that is similar to Mitt Romney. And my guess is, if I were a betting man, and I'm not going to bet, but, you know, that he'll probably lose uh, ultimately uh, in, in 2000. Even if he gets the Republican nomination. I think he'll win the nomination and lose mm -hmm. the general. I mean, that'd mm -hmm. be my guess. But my point being that Romney... Uh, even if we never hear from Romney again after 2012, to me what's more important almost is that he is an epitome of a trend and that he goes away maybe after the November election, let's presume that happens for the sake of this discussion, there's still all these people who are governors, members of Congress, in the state legislatures where all this policy is being crafted that do have this worldview and it is rather consistent, and it is an economic elitist worldview tied with religion. That, to me, is very mm -hmm. ominous, and I think the laws already passed are, are strong evidence of it. Uh, we haven't talked about, for example, the parsonage exemption, which I think is an engine of right-wing politics in, in America, an economic engine of it. And a lot of that I don't think is focused on by the mainstream media and, and needs to be. Mm. Well, listen, um, this has been a really great discussion, and I'm really glad that we did it. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about my book. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.